Well, good morning, my friends on the Aquarium Online Academy. Welcome back. We're going to be doing a really fun game with you all today, but you get to participate too. So while we're playing I Spy together, you can text us your observations or your questions at 562-286-1838. You can also email us at live at lbaop.org. So if you're not watching live on the air right now, Monday at 9 a.m., you can email us questions and we'll have our educators help answer them for you but let's get started playing our favorite game of i spy but in the ocean <gasps> oh my gosh did you see that whoa that shark got so close well let's see mm -mm. we should practice first right okay well i'm gonna step out what do you notice? Do you see anything? Did you find anything that's really cool inside Shark Lagoon? You can whisper it to anybody around you. You can shout it if that's okay. Sometimes shouting is not okay. You can even just say it to the screen. Maybe we'll hear you through the internet. Some of you found the turtle. Yes. We have a sea turtle hanging out in here. We uh, have lots of sharks. As you should in a shark lagoon. What else do we see? Hmm. I spy... What? Okay, the turtle's gonna get in the way, so we're gonna have to pause. <gasps> Hello, sea turtle. We have three turtles here total at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Two of this species... Oh, is he gonna give us... Oh, oh he's gonna try and re reposition the camera. <laughs> Stop looking at me! <laughs> Maybe that's what he said. I don't know. I don't speak turtle. But... The turtles don't mind bumping into stuff. All right, I spy something that looks like a rock. If it looks like a rock, maybe it's not actually a rock. Hmm. What looks like a rock in here, but is not a rock? This stuff. Not the shark. What's behind the shark? The coral. It's the coral. So coral is an animal too. All the things that are in here besides the actual rocks would be animals. Now our coral is a replica. It's not real coral. Real coral is actually very sensitive. It takes a lot of effort to keep real coral alive. But if it were real coral, it'd be an animal too. Now besides the algae that grows in the walls, because that's what happens in an aquarium, nothing else in here is non-animal. We have the non-living things like the rocks, the pebbles, the sand, and the decorative coral. And then we have just lots of fish. The sharks and the tropical fish. Hmm. Now what kind of sharks do we have? That's a pretty common question we get here. So while we're exploring sharks, and Emily's bringing some questions in from the text line, we have gray reef sharks right there. This thing sitting on the ground, that is a zebra shark. We can only see their tail for the moment. Oh, there's one back there. The other zebra shark. And we have black tip reef sharks too. So we have gray reef sharks and black tip reef sharks. The zebra sharks are turtle. And then lots and lots of fish. All right, now our first question came in from Caleb asking, how do sharks capture their prey? Well, sharks are probably the best at playing eye spy because they have one, really good vision, two, an exceptional sense of smell, but then their sense of hearing is really, really good. So sound travels much faster in water than in air. So when we hear stuff, sound can actually be measured at, at speed. Have you ever heard of breaking the sound barrier, traveling faster than sound? Well, underwater, sound travels faster. And the sound doesn't lose what's called intensity. It stays really loud for a long distance. Oh, the turtle's back. Hide. Everybody hide. Okay, the turtle left. Oh, he still bumped into it. We're going to have to have the divers fix that later. <laughs> he really likes that camera. So when sound travels really quickly underwater, it doesn't lose its intensity. The waves of the sound stay about the same for a very long period of time. And because of that, sharks can hear from, from miles. They can hear sounds very, very far away. Now, their sense of smell is so strong you would say because they can actually smell in direction 
Like we can hear in direction. So if somebody snaps their fingers over here versus over here, the sound travels to your ears at different speeds because they're not in the same spot. And you can tell where something is based on the sound. Well, sharks can smell in direction because the smell might be intense that direction or more intense that direction. So they can tell that there's food to the right or to the left or up or down from them compared to other directions. So when they try to look for prey, if they can't see it, maybe they're actually in the depth of the ocean where it's too dark. If they can't hear it, maybe they can smell it. But if they get close enough, they have another sense called the ampullae of Lorenzini. These are little pores or pits in their face. Let's see if we can get a picture of a shark up here. We could probably point it out to you. But they have little pores in their face. And there's little tiny hairs that are really sensitive around their sides. So they can sense motion. But then the, the pores in their face allow them to sense electricity. And how this helps them is to help get the food in the mouth. Or if they're searching in the sand. So let's say you're a... Uh, horn shark. A horn shark will eat food from the sea floor. So they might be very close to it and they can sense it from about four inches away. Well, it's about like a closed fist. It's about four inches. They can sense it from that distance. So if it's buried in the sand and they're looking for it, sharks and rays that eat from the sea floor can find their food that's buried. But for other bigger sharks, if they can't see because they can't look down at their food, they have to be able to sense where the food is at to get it into their mouth. So that ampullae helps the food get into their mouth. Now, other sharks have more sensitive ampullae or more sensitive uh, sight. They can see better in the dark or they can see better at, in motion. <clears throat> so right here, see these little black dots on the nose and the face of this uh, blue shark? This is a local species. Those little dots are the ampullae Lorenzini. Now, the tougher thing to find is their sense of motion down the lateral line then it's just a stripe that goes down their side, but it's kind of an invisible stripe on most fish. And it has little hairs that can sense motion. So if something was swimming or moving over there, they could feel the water move on that lateral line. So Caleb, they have lots of ways to find their prey. Pretty cool question. All right, let's play another I Spy. Allie, what should we look at to try and find an animal with our friends out there? Ooh. What? What do you see? Hmm. Let's make some observations together, remember? We are looking and we are thinking. Hmm. I can see some seagrass and some seaweed. Hmm. Oh! Did you see it? What's down there? Now, if you can't quite see, you might have to use your special binoculars. They're moving! What is it? The seahorses! Now, I could have made it really challenging and told you the sand dollars, but the seahorses are so much cooler. At least in terms to look at. Seahorses, like this one, we zoomed in on our seahorse friend. These are the Pacific seahorse. Now, these are some of the biggest seahorses in the world. And they live here in Southern California. It's farther south than Long Beach, usually around San Diego, but sometimes around here. And farther south into the Baja of Mexico. So, but they live around this area, and they're some of the biggest seahorses on the planet. Now, some of the smallest are like the dwarf seahorse, and they're actually only about that big. Total, that's as big as they get. Now, all seahorses are fish. The seahorse, the sea dragons, and their cousins, the ribbon dragons, are all in the same group. But they're all fish, too. Oh, Concha found this seahorse, too. Good job, Concha. Welcome back to viewing our Aquarium Online Academy. Now, when you look at the body of a seahorse, it's a little different than other fish. Their, their bodies are almost in like the shape of a question mark, or their tail curls up like this. Their tails are muscular. So their tail, just like what it's doing right here, could curl around and grab onto one of those pieces of seagrass back here, or a rock, or even their friend. Sometimes they actually hold on to each other. And they don't really have big fins. They have three little fins. So they have this one here on the back. But then they have two little ones up here. You can almost see this little line. is where they have these little fins right here. You want to do some seahorse fins with me? All right. Just looks like, th like this. But they don't swim very fast. So you just... Oh, I'm going to come back this way. They don't swim very fast at all. Scientists have actually measured how... 
fast or how slow they actually are. They're considered the slowest swimming fish. Some seahorses only swim about five feet an hour. That's a lot of time to go that far. But that's because they have very small fins. They aren't really built for swimming across distances. They're built to hold on to stuff with this muscular prehensile tail. If you've heard the word prehensile before, we describe that on a monkey's tail. They can reach and grab onto stuff. It's muscular, it can actually move, and they can choose what to hold on to. Now, uh, Isla asked, how do they eat? Oh, one of my favorite things to talk about is how seahorses eat. When you watch them eat, this long snout is kind of built like a trapdoor, like this. And what they do is they will open their mouth and lurch their head forward and then suck the food in really quickly. Now what they eat is typically plankton or small little floating things. And they can suck the water in so fast that the plankton cannot swim away. That's really quick. It's like if you could inhale your, your cheeseburger or your rice or, I don't know, Cheerios, and then they just so fast the food would never have any chance of escaping. They are one of the most accurate and successful hunters. So when they watch seahorses eat, they could actually record how many times it attempted to catch a piece of plankton and how many times it succeeded in catching that plankton. And it's extremely high. The other cool thing about their little heads is that the bones in their skull are not fused. Now, when we grow up, ours are. This is why it's, you have to be really careful with a baby human because the bones in their skull are not fused. So their heads are actually kind of soft. But on a seahorse, it's not that you know their heads are soft, but the bones haven't really fused. So when they do this motion called snicking, you can actually, if you're really, really quiet and you listen really carefully, you could hear the bones knocking together. That's kind of crazy, but kind of cool. There's a little piece of plankton that could be eating. So when you watch them feed, they suddenly will lurch their face forward. Yep, just like that. Scoop that water into their mouth really quickly by just vacuuming it in. And then their food cannot escape. They don't have to chase their food down because their food swims even slower than they do. Pretty advantageous. So that is how seahorses eat. Great question, Isla. All right, let's see. What other animals should we try to look for today, Allie? She's trying to find something cool for us to look at. Now, the other animals that were hanging out with those seahorses were called sand dollars. Sand dollars are like a pancake sea urchin without the big spikes. We can talk about them in a little bit. This doesn't look like an aquarium, uh, Allie. But this is one of our exhibits here. We have lots of animals that live at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Not all of them are under the water all the time. Some of them are really important to talk about because they're important about their ecosystem. But let's see if we can find who's hiding in this space. Hmm. There's not a lot in here. Maybe some colors will help us. Do you notice any special colors going on in this exhibit? I see green over here, and oh, I see green right here. Is this an animal to you? Hmm, looks kind of like a lumpy green blob. Let's zoom in a little bit. Maybe we can take a closer look at what that is. Oh my gosh, he's so cute. Look at this cute little frog. Frogs are amphibians. So... Amphibians and reptiles might look similar at times, but they're very different animals. Reptiles will have rough skin, lungs, and they'll hatch from an egg, and they look very similar to their adult self. Frogs, on the other hand, their eggs are hatched underwater. No matter what kind of frog it is, their eggs are hatched in the water. And then they start as a tadpole, and they go through this metamorphosis, which is a big science word for they changed a lot. And they changed into a frog. So they start to lose the tail. Their, their legs and arms grow out. They turn into what's called a little froglet, which is a frog with a tail. And then they lose their tail. And then depending on what kind of habitat they live in, maybe they're a terrestrial frog or a tree frog or they're a really aquatic style frog. They'll be able to move up to the habitat that they're supposed to be in. Now, amphibians also have really sensitive skin. 
they can absorb a small amount of oxygen through their skin, but also chemicals can get through their skin too. Our skin is extremely resilient. So stuff is not supposed to go through our skin, except, you know, like when you put lotion on, it absorbs into your skin, but otherwise our skin's uh, waterproof, basically. But their skin is not. So something that is dissolved in the water could get into their skin. So frogs are important to their habitat because they're what we call an indicator species. If there's a lot of frogs where there's supposed to be frogs, that's a healthy ecosystem. If there aren't a lot of frogs where there's supposed to be frogs, that means that ecosystem is unhealthy, polluted or dirty or something's going on that's not supposed to be there. And so that could be an important factor that we look at is whether or not frogs are in that ecosystem. Now let's go back to a picture of our seahorse friend because someone asked, what eats seahorses? They're kind of bony and kind of tough to eat, but there are animals that would eat them. There are predators that would be looking for something that can't swim very fast, sits usually around on the sea floor. So other large fish, maybe some rays, maybe some sharks, but there's a lot of animals that might try to eat them. But because they have these really bony bodies, these are actually like rings of bone inside their body. It's like their entire body is a rib cage almost. They're, they're not the easiest for most animals to eat. So their ability to hide among the seagrasses and the seaweed allows them to hide from a lot of predators. But there's still things that would try to munch on them and chew on them because that's how predation works. There's another animal that has adapted or has developed those abilities to eat something. So if that were a main food source in that area, the predators in that area would have to be able to find them and eat them in order to survive. So in some areas, maybe they don't have a whole lot of predators because they're really good at hiding. One of the really tiny seahorses looks exactly like the piece of coral it sits on. That's a really good adaptation. It's a really good camouflage. Uh, we don't have those here, but the dwarf seahorses are pretty small. So if you're not watching really, really closely, you'd probably miss them and go right by and try to find something else. The other thing is not everything can eat the little stuff. Here's a dwarf seahorse. Now that blade of seagrass is about half the width of my pinky. That's a pretty tiny little seahorse. So sometimes being really small helps you hide because other things need to eat big stuff. Or they have to be able to filter feed a lot of animals out so they can eat smaller things. But if you're sitting on the seagrass, it's hard to filter those out because they're stuck to the grass. So pretty good adaptations, but they do have natural predators. Good question. All right, let's go back to the frog real quick and then Allie can pick us another exhibit we can try to spy some animals into. Now frogs, like reptiles, birds, mammals, fish, they have a skeleton. It might not look like it because in some cases they're so small and so fragile looking. How could they have a skeleton? But they do. They have a skeleton made of bone. Now fish have skeletons of bone or cartilage. Sharks have cartilage skeletons. The other fish have bony skeletons. Frogs, all their amphibians, reptiles, mammals, birds, we all have a bony skeleton. It's just that our skeletons differ in composition, what it's made of, or the size or density, the thickness of our bones. So some animals have a really dense skeleton and some animals have a really light skeleton. All right, what did Allie pick for us? Ooh, lots of rocks. What could be in this little exhibit? Hmm. Let's keep spying. Maybe. Oh, what just happened? That rock started swimming. That is one of our spiny lump suckers. Another fish not so good at the swimming part of being a fish. That's okay. Fish don't have to swim. How many lump suckers can you find in this exhibit? Now we had the one that swam up top. We'll start the, the video over again so we can play. A little bit more I spy. Hold on, we're gonna reset it. It's gonna take a moment. So this is what they look like up close. But now we're gonna try and count how many we have. How many do you see? This one's kind of a tricky one because I have found four. All right, so we have this one that oh, left off and <laughs> flies away. Do you wanna make sound effects for how they swim too? That's what I would imagine, at least underwater. Okay, I see one here. This one's moving. This one, I see eyes right here. Hmm. I see this one that was sitting next to our friend that was swimming around. This one might be one. 
Kind of looks like a rock. But guess what? We have a really sneaky, sneaky spiny lump sucker right there. Do you see their little eyes poking up above the bottom of the screen? Just doing these. Really, really good at hiding. Now, spiny lump suckers are fish that have adapted the ability to sit still on a thing like a rock, a blade of seaweed or kelp. And their pectoral fins right here, we saw them very hurriedly moving when they were trying to swim around. But the fins on the underside, pelvic fins, they kind of suction cup right onto a surface. So let's make some quick observations about our lump sucker while we answer conscious question about the frogs. When frogs get bigger, do they still breathe underwater? Ah. Well, as they grow up and they become more of a frog and less of a tadpole, their lungs develop and they can breathe outside of water. Now, some of their cousins, like the salamanders or the axolotls, will maintain some of their underwater breathing abilities. So an axolotl has their gills kind of sticking out, almost looks like hair, fantastic hair. If you watch any of our uh, videos from the Pacific Pals, Axel the axolotl looks kind of like this. These are gills that stick out. They never retract into the body. So it's kind of like they just stop developing into a bigger, that person cannot hold the camera straight. They don't develop into a bigger kind of amphibian. So they will stay underwater a lot more often and still be able to breathe underwater. But frogs, frogs will develop complete lungs so they can breathe air when they get out of the water like our tree frogs will. Good question, Concha. Because some amphibians will stay underwater, or they'll do both. They'll be out of water and underwater, and they can breathe in both. And then there's the frog that really only breathes air, when they're an adult, anyways. Good question. Amphibians are a very interesting group of animals. I recommend you look up some questions to ask us about them. All right. The spiny lump sucker. Now, I've seen a picture of an x-ray of their body. It's incredible. I recommend you have an adult help you find an x-ray picture of a spiny lump sucker because their body is like 50% face. I mean, look at how big their head is compared to the rest of them. It's like a ping pong ball with face, but spiny too. So their eyes are very large to make it easier to see in darker areas of the water. They have these big pokey parts to their body, which are actually rigid. You can see these spiny sections of their skin in the x-ray. That's a nice protection so that things don't want to grab or chew on you because if it's too pokey to eat, they won't eat it. But then there's like nothing else back here besides the rest of their organs and stuff. Their fins are very reduced in size and ability to swim. They're much better at sitting still. They've also adapted the ability to ambush their prey because it gets too close to the face and they suck it in just like a seahorse would. So if for animals that can't swim very fast or chase their food, chances are they're going to ambush their food. Wait for it to get too close, and then they snatch it up. It's kind of like if somebody's waving a piece of candy, and yeah, you can't reach it, you can't reach it, and you suddenly grab it. You're... It's almost that time of year to eat lots and lots of candy. You should practice your ambush skills. Like a spiny lump sucker. You just sit there and wait for candy to get too close, and you grab it, and you eat it really quickly. So the spiny lump sucker... The seahorse, frogfish, stonefish, scorpionfish, lots of fish actually adapted away the abilities to swim well and have adapted instead ways to sit still and wait for food to come near them. And that way they can catch their food when it gets too close. They don't have to expend a lot of energy chasing after their food. And in some cases, they need to also be able to hold on to stuff while they sit there. Pretty cool animals. All right, I think we have time for one more Exhibit, we should play some I Spy on. Oh. Well, I'll give you a hint. It's not the sea stars or the sea anemones here on the bottom of it. Where's the animal? I'm going to need my special binoculars again. Can you see them? Mm-hmm. Mm. Wait. Where is it? It's over in the corner. I don't see anything over in the corner down here. Oh, it's in this corner. Who's up in the corner? 
Mm, let's take a closer look, Allie. Who could be hiding in the corner of this exhibit? Oh. The giant Pacific octopus. Or the GPO, as we like to call it, because it takes a lot of time to call it the giant Pacific octopus. You have to say it just like that, too. Otherwise, it doesn't have the same effect. Because they get really big. A GPO can get, I think, 12 to 16 feet wide when they just lazily stretch their, their arms, their tentacles out. And over 100 pounds in some cases. Now, ours, this is Godzilla. Godzilla is like 45 pounds-ish. I think it's in the 40s, yeah. Which is a pretty big octopus. At that size, they can't crawl out of an exhibit and pull themselves around. So for other octopus, they stay pretty small. Reasonably sized. Maybe a little bit bigger. But a giant Pacific octopus gets huge. And at that point, they're not going to be crawling around tide pools. They'll be hiding in instead in the rocks and in the depths of the water. And their abilities to hide are exceptional. They have the best camouflage. They can also change... Not only the color of their skin, but the texture of their skin, too. Now, we commonly call these tentacles. But in scientific terms, an octopus has eight arms. Because their cousins, the squid, have eight arms and then two tentacles. So an arm has suction cups all the way down the length. Whereas a tentacle, like a squid, only has suction cups at the very end. Kind of like if you pretend these were... Squid tentacles, only on the palms of your hands would there be suction cups. And then they can grab their food like an ocean ninja. So, eight arms. If you say tentacles, tentacles, we'll know, we'll know what you mean. And then they have eyes. Move that tentacle. Or arm. Whatever. Move it. There, there we go. Eyeballs. Their eyes are really, really, really well developed. So, a lot of times we compare how animals are next to people. Like, do they have as good a hearing as we do? Do they have as good a sight as we do? Or better? Well, their senses are extremely refined. So they can smell and taste. It's the same thing in the same spot. These suction cups... Right there. These suction cups... Stop moving, guys. Oh, my gosh. These suction cups help them to taste and smell. So whatever they touched, they could tell what it is. So instead of having to taste it with your tongue, you could taste it with your fingertips. Something like that idea which would kind of be gross because no matter what you touch, you can taste. Keep that in mind. But their suction cups are extremely powerful. One suction cup might have the strength to hold a standard bowling ball by itself. By itself. And then they have almost 250 per arm. And they have eight arms. So they have almost 2,000 suction cups that could fling 2,000 bowling balls. Imagine trying to bowl against an octopus. That'd be crazy. Uh, Conscious asks, Conscious you found the octopus and the tentacles too. Good job, Concha. I'm glad you could find them faster than I could. Now, an octopus has an interesting body. I'm going to use my stuffed animal friend to demonstrate. So when we look at them, it looks like they have a big old alien head. Like extraterrestrial kind of alien. Like outer space kind of animals. But in reality, their body's very similar to ours. It's just in a different arrangement. So they have the head which is just this middle section right here. So only this middle part right here is the head. Well, then what's this part? And then these we know are like the, the arms and legs appendages part. So if you compare it to us, because remember, we like to compare things to us. If you took your arms and legs off from where they're at, also you'd have to double them, so get eight of them, and then glue them all to your face right here. Ah, you would be an octopus. This up here, this is like their tummy, their abdomen, this part has all the organs, their gills, their stomach, their intestines, their reproductive organs, all of the guts are up here in what looks like the head. So in this space right here, that is where all the internal organs are. And then they have their head in the middle, which has the brain. And then their appendages, their arms and legs, so to speak, are out here. So their bodies are very similar in that all of the guts are in one spot. Their head is in another spot, but then their arms and legs are attached to another spot. So when we named them in science, we called them cephalopods, which means head foot. Their head is attached to their feet, which is why if you wanted to be an octopus, pop those off, glue them to your face, and you're an octopus. I don't recommend doing it. It's kind of challenging. 
I know, it, we couldn't actually do that. But that's how an octopus is. Well, we had some fun playing I Spy today. Great observations from our viewers hanging out with us, viewing the animals with us, and asking some really good questions today. We're going to leave you watching the penguins for a few seconds because now that they've all finished molting, they're all happy and dancing and they like to swim again. This is migratory season for them, so they're going to be way more active in the water. So check out our webcams when you can, and stay tuned for our next episode of the Aquarium Online Academy. Bye, everybody!